We're ready for number four. Blue Nalu, Lou Cooper House. Lou? Hey, still good morning. So good morning to everybody. First, I want to say congratulations to the great uh, competitors in the Big Pitch uh, competition. Um, my name is Lou Cooperhouse. I'm co-founder, president, and CEO of Blue Nalu. Our company is the global leader in a new and fast-growing category that we call cellular aquaculture, which will be providing great-tasting, healthy, safe, and trusted seafood products that we will manufacture that will directly address some of the global challenges we have to our supply chain for seafood on our planet and our ability to feed our global population in the decades to come. Let's start off with some basics. And our company was formed in response to a number of issues uh, that, that are surrounding us today that we're all quite familiar with. Uh, first, an obvious point, healthy oceans are critical for all life forms, covering two thirds of our, of our planet's surface, providing us with over 30,000 uh, wonderful diverse species of fish, uh, providing us with over 50% of our oxygen in our atmosphere and acting as a global regulator for our climate. We need to preserve these healthy oceans. At the same time, consumers are shifting away from eating red meat uh, towards more nutritious and delicious uh, seafood options that we have available to us. Uh, in fact, uh, the UN FAO has identified that the, uh, the largest per capita consumption ever uh, has occurred in its last uh, data assessment with uh, Asia leading the charge with over 20 kilograms per capita globally consumed, uh, followed by, uh, closely by uh, EU and North America in global seafood consumption. But here's the problem. As we all know, demand is increasing. That's very exciting. But our supply is diminishing and in many cases disappearing. Ocean fish numbers are on the brink of collapse, says WWF, with many species reducing dramatically due to overfishing, acidification, uh, rising temperatures in our oceans, pollutants, viruses, and many other reasons, also affecting regional economies of developing countries who rely on the fishing industry as a primary source of their economic vitality. So in my 35-year career in the food industry, I've been at Campbell's, Nestle, ConAgra, been involved with a number of startups, uh, and also president of several companies. Um, but I've also witnessed a dramatic shift um, in the last five years in particular as we as, an, as, a, as a global population have really evolved from looking for foods that were good for ourselves or for our family, foods that represent what's on the left here, you know, convenient, fresh, specialty, local products, still adopting these same principles, but really seeking out products that are good for the planet, foods that are sustainable, represent social responsibility, purpose, respect for our environment, trusted, and increasingly that are slaughter free. Consumers, however, while they're, while they're looking for more uh, seafood choices in their diet due to the nutrition that we talked about, are increasingly concerned about uh, their seafood options for a variety of reasons that we're all quite familiar with, which I've kind of illustrated here on this slide. Ocean health and ocean, uh, overfishing, illegal fishing, climate change, viruses, pollutants, ecosystem health with habitat damage and bycatch, community health and labor practices and occupational safety that occur, many of which have been publicized. Animal welfare is a huge issue for many people. The, the slaughter attributes in which occur in our fishing industry and factory farming, and also personal welfare, the fact that uh, there's, there's warnings on products for mercury, toxins, and poisons, but also pathogens, parasites, microplastics that occur from plastic pollution, and the increasing, increasingly uh, known issues associated with fraud in our industry and the traceability that really does not exist like it does in other aspects of the food industry. So what is the solution? So Blue Nalu was created to really be a disruptor to supplement the current industry practice in which fish are farmed or wild caught in our oceans and seas, but instead produced, manufactured from fish cells. It's akin to in vitro fertilization that we all know from humans, but it's, we're doing this in a way that will be healthy for people, humane for animals, and sustainable for our planet. Our technology platform will allow us to produce a wide array of seafood choices, a five ounce filet of salmon, fully yielded, 100%, no head, no tail, um, scallops without the shell, of course, and shrimp as well. 
So in both commodity and value-added form for markets across the globe. We've trademarked the term cellular aquaculture. We've also trademarked the term eating blue uh, as, a, as a way to communicate that consumers can consider, should consider the oceans and make more sustainable decisions with, with their seafood choices. Our products that we will ultimately produce will, of course, be of outstanding taste and quality, representing all the sensory attributes that you expect from your seafood, flavor, texture, mouthfeel, aroma, but also healthy for the person, the environment, and the planet and free of any environmental contaminants, and of course, absolutely safe. How did this all begin? Interestingly, uh, myself and my other two co-founders initially met in the state of Hawaii. Um, interesting location, being in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, roughly 2,500 miles from any major landmass, in the middle of where there's just a tremendous diversity of seafood species for us to enjoy in, in various ways. We chose the name Nalu, Blue Nalu, uh, Nalu is a Hawaiian word that conveys the essence of what we're all about. It's, it represents the word for wave in, in uh, Hawaiian, but it's also a wave of change that we're looking to make with citizens across our planet. Nalu also is interesting, it's a slang in Hawaiian. Uh, there's a term called Naluit, which is go with the flow, but it's also being mindful, meditative, and contemplative about your choices. So it's really an outstanding term uh, for our company. I mentioned two co-founders, Chris Samoji and Chris Damon. Um, the three of us collectively have over 100 years of experience in the diverse array of disciplines that are critical for success in this really challenging field. These, these uh, core competencies include cell biology, tissue engineering, biomedical engineering, uh, the ability to bioprint, 3D bioprint products, understand food innovation, commercialization, extrusion technology. Uh, we have a vast expertise in intellectual property. And, and, and a tremendous background in new business startups as well as exits. We've also located at San Diego. Um, we're, we're quite uh, embraced in the community there and have actually hired some outstanding scientists who come from Scripps and Organovo with just some great background in cell biology and tissue culture. We surrounded ourselves with a team of, of uh, contractor resources and finance, marketing, regulatory uh, policy and engineering and design. Um, that really rounds out our team. But also, we haven't yet announced this publicly, but we have on board uh, thus far seven and a few more that will be announced shortly. Uh, an advisory board that represents uh, some of the best uh, on our globe that really can assist us with consumer insight, brand strategy, uh, and technology commercialization. Uh, to name some of these folks, it includes Ann Veneman, the former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture and former Executive Director of UNICEF. Uh, Susie Fogelson, who is former Z Senior VP of Marketing and Brand Strategy the Food Network and also uh, one of the judges you might have seen in the earlier years of that of Food Network and Cooking Channel. And J.B. Kelly III, uh, the president of the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation USA, uh, supplemented by Carlos Barroso and Tim Mork, Roy Yamaguchi and Kevin Lyons, who bring collectively just a great expertise in, in uh, R&D, technology, strategy, and commercialization, uh, nutrition, uh, culinary arts and sustainability. So what is our technology? Um, interestingly, we did not come up with this idea. Uh, Winston Churchill said back in 1932, something I should read to you in an article called 50 Years Hence, that was in Popular Mechanics back in the, back in the day, we shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat a breast or a wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. The new foods will be practically indistinguishable from the natural products from the outset, and any changes will be so gradual as to escape observation. He called this 50 years hence, thinking this might occur in the 80s, but in fact, it was really 2014 uh, when, the, when the individual on the top left, Mark Post in the Netherlands at Maastricht University, first developed what was then called a lab-grown or in vitro hamburger, um, funded by one of the founders of Google, um, and actually uh, really began uh, a, a quick growth of other companies that started up in this whole space, initially focused on meat and poultry and pork because these are mammals and some of the science was a lot more evident. Um, Inc. Magazine has, shows the cover of the uh, founder of Memphis Meats, which has raised the greatest amount thus far in their A round. They, they uh, received $17 million. Bill Gates and Richard Branson are some of the uh, philanthropists that have funded these programs, but also we're seeing Tyson Ventures uh, and Merck invest in these companies as well, and we're seeing increasing investment in this entire space. Uh, we'll talk more about the seafood category in a second, 
But let me begin with a little overview of the process. Um, it's really three, it's complex, but it's three core technologies that need to be addressed. One is isolating the cells from the fish itself, the fat cells, the muscle cells, the fibroblasts uh, from the specific locations that vary by type of fish. And the key is how do we get them to proliferate, to not die, and to continue to grow into the millions and billions and do this in a very controlled way, ultimately to create some structure around them, some scaffolds that protects them from stress, provides them nutrition and structure, and ultimately makes them edible through an extrusion or a 3D bioprinting process, creating ultimately a factory that's a food factory that's similar to some of the same factories that we might see in, in industry today that can make these, uh, uh, these high-valued uh, products that actually, again, imitate all the same sensory attributes that we expect, the taste, the texture, the mouthfeel, uh, so these will be absolutely accepted by consumers. We're pleased to announce we've actually uh, have proof of concept in a very quick fashion. You have to realize that, again, these are not mammals, so there's really no evidence, there's no literature that supports that these cells can even be proliferated. We are beginning from zero. And the entire industry in the fish category is beginning the same place. Um, but we are excited to announce, this is the first public announcement about this, that we've actually uh, shown two different species of fin fish that have, we've, which we've proliferated muscle cells uh, for over 40 days thus far. Again, there's no evidence this has ever been done before. Um, we accomplish this through our own proprietary mixture of media, um, just really uh, looking at many, many uh, uh, components that we thought would uh, allow for cell proliferation. Muscle cells are important because they represent 80% of the cell volume that we ultimately need to produce uh, the fish. We've also done this with fibroblasts. Uh, this has been uh, done by others in industry, in the meat poultry sector, um, we don't have any evidence anybody's done this in the seafood sector thus far. Um, but again, we're growing out cells, as you can see, in this uh, day one to day seven uh, time lapse. So as I mentioned, there's a tremendous opportunity for IP strategy for our company. Again, the space is wide open. It's a blank canvas. Um, there's really two core components in which the technology can be adapted. Uh, first is media composition and the culturing techniques that we'll apply. Um, our ability to grow these cells for a long time, um, the type of medium that we use, uh, the way that we uh, can really uh, adopt this across various species. We've actually seen a, a huge difference between one fin fish and the other, but also certainly between fin fish, crustaceans, and mollusks. We've also we've done uh, work already on all these uh, various categories of fish. And secondly, on how we ultimately go and manufacture these products. Um, the nozzle design for large volume bioprinting, the type of ink that we might use in this printing process, um, and also uh, various types of weight methodologies to make sure that these products form in the proper way. Our whole, our whole goal and one key reason we love, we're very excited to be at this conference is all about partnering. So again, our, our team has a tremendous uh, background in partnering strategically. We've already accomplished uh, several of these uh, in cell lines and culture media, scaffolding, bioreactors, but we're particularly excited to talk about uh, supply and distribution partnerships. Um, this kind of graphic on the right was uh, done by uh, an organization called the Good Food Institute. I have some materials of theirs at my booth, um, but they really uh, have really done a great job explaining the technology uh, in very uh, broad strokes uh, for the layman. So let me tell you more about our, our recent financing and, and how we would utilize the funds if awarded the Neptune Award by the Ocean Exchange. So we're really excited that just uh, a few months ago, we announced a $4.5 million seed round. This is the largest seed round in the entire uh, ag uh, cellular aquaculture, the, the clean fish, the seafood arena. Uh, there's a few smaller companies that uh, launched a couple years ago, um, but we were seen as a different kind of team that can really execute this. You can see some of the headlines that we were able to achieve. What was exciting was that we also have a global representation of investors from 25 organizations from five nations, uh, US, UK, Hong Kong, Luxembourg, and Israel that provided funding to us. Um, there's some significant investors, uh, all of which are unannounced, uh, that have the wherewithal clearly to come in for the A round, which we will launch next year. So Chris Kerr, you know, uh, Chief Investment Officer at our lead investor, New Crop Capital, you know, indicate this is largest C round to date, one of the largest that occur globally in the entire clean meat space. 
um, and he you know, obviously showed his excitement for our ability to offer consumers an alternative to conventional animal sources that today only originate in our oceans and seas. So if awarded the $100,000 funding, we would specifically allocate this and target this towards something that we weren't contemplating before, but actually thinking towards the end, with the end in mind, what would a manufacturing facility actually look like? Uh, to actually design the first ever business and engineering model for large scale production that doesn't currently exist and to actually hire the engineers, uh, bioprocessing, food engineering for both commodity value added products to accomplish this. Uh, you know, we've done a, a first really rough draft of this, you know, that would actually support 15 million pounds of production, um, supporting the initial population uh, or, or seafood consumption needs for a regional population of about 20 million people, roughly the, the New York metropolitan area, which we'd obviously multiply across other regions across the planet. We have a tremendous team in place. The market is enormous. Our technology strategy, we think, is very sound. Our revenue potential, we think, is also quite significant. And very importantly, we're also aligned with a number uh, of the sustainable development goals of the UN, in fact, over half of them. Certainly life below water, zero hunger, industry, innovation, infrastructure, uh, but also uh, good health, clean water, sustainable cities, responsible consumption, climate action, and partnerships for the goals. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Great. Tom, great job. <laughs> questions? Um, you know, whenever I've heard of people making hang hamburger, I imagine in a Petri dish, and something about that just kind of didn't sound very appealing. The, the, the 3D printing of it, though, I, I've seen some stuff where they're doing cellular things and, and replacement uh, of cells. Talk a little bit about how that builds up into something that actually looks like a piece of salmon. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, so we're still developing what that technology might ultimately look like, but in the case of 3D printing, I always use the term like lasagna. So we're taking multiple layers of fish. We, we're, look, we're If you think of maybe two items right now in your head, you know, a scallop and also maybe a five ounce salmon filet. So a scallop is an interesting homogeneous structure that can in fact, you know, is a bit spongy like in material and in fact can be extruded or bioprinted. Um, so the technology would actually be adapted for various products that we would manufacture. Um, but that's one that would be done either by layers or would actually through an extrusion process. In the case of salmon, if you think of a, of a fillet of salmon right now on your plate, in a virtual plate in front of you, um, you might actually see it as having maybe a 45 degree angle in there uh, where, where the layers are separated. So unlike meat and poultry, which is quite complex to do, say, a ribeye steak, right. um, you know, as, as, as you illustrated, so the, the technology began with things like hamburger, ground meat, and even the plant-based world has started the same way. Um, our equivalent might be surimi, you know, something that's ground up and formed and it's a lower, mm -hmm. uh, you know, lower value product. But whereas the meat and poultry folks would have a challenging time to get into a ribeye steak, just given the, the complexity and the marbling that exists, our ability to get into high valued items like scallops and salmon, right. Uh, red snapper and endangered species is quite significant. But again, it would be, I think the challenge is, is clearly scale. And our ability to manufacture high volumes of product, um, it'll be the first application of a massively parallel bioprinting process that today currently doesn't exist, yeah. but through partnerships we'll get there. Wow, that's great. Over here, we got one. Question, what are you feeding it? What's the input material to create the cells? The cells need energy, they need nitrogen. What, what are you gonna be using to do that? Yeah, so the question was about uh, what are we feeding the, the cells? So, so we're feeding the cells the same things that they would get in, in a natural environment. So we're actually looking at uh, various types of media uh, comp composition that, would, that do provide nutrition, including algae. Um, but we're uh, currently the model for this entire industry uses something called FBS, which is actually stands for fetal bovine serum. So, so the meat and poultry folks and the industry standard that exists is not very pretty. So we're dealing with aborted calves to create something for a, a humane uh, methodology. Yeah. But we're actually already exploring a number of, of uh, animal-free medium. We've already had some successes, and we're working with a few partners to actually come up with a proprietary source. So that's, that is a key question. Um, that is that is in our proprietary uh, knowledge base, to, to be honest. Yeah, it'll be counterproductive to use cows to make Absolutely. fish. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <All right. laughs> Over here, Jane. So I'm excited. Let's disrupt together. 
I'm over here. Oh, there you are. I can't see. It's on the side. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so let's disrupt together. My first question is, um, since you're going to 3D print this stuff that we're going to eat, why would you stick to species as we know them? Why wouldn't you create something that's part salmon, part scallop, part seaweed, <laughs> part something else, so it wouldn't have to look or act like something that we used to expect on the plate, and you could build in any set of nutrients you want. That's the first question. The second is, what happens to the ship to the fishing industry if this model takes off? So two great questions. So the first one was about um, uh, it was about the why go why go with a why not make oh, something, something hybrid something unique yeah so so, so be, being a, a food guy if you will with the background food industry it's 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 been cons consistently uh, the process to actually go for early adopters that will take something that you already have an expectation so, so however uh, one can actually identify a species that is currently endangered, provide this back to consumers again, but perhaps in an in in ultimate form, optimal form. Maybe it's higher in omega-3s because this particular fish doesn't have that. So there is the opportunity. So process one is let's do and replicate what consumers expect with the same nutritional profile. But there is an evolution opportunity to actually supplement that with more fortified nutrition and make this a, a real source of protein and fiber and things like that. Uh, but also to, to really, uh, we've not certainly thought about that, that kind of process to create a new hybrid, if you will, but certainly the opportunity to, uh, to really provide species that don't cur are not, not currently available. I think one of the opportunities, too, is the price point. So right now we have these huge fluctuations in pricing due to the availability of seafood on our planet, so we can stabilize the price point um, and actually make, make product in America, if you will, that's currently imported. So back to your question about, your second question about local jobs and fisheries. The word I use specifically, we, we are a disruptor, but we're also a supplementer. So we will continue to, to consume fish from the old fashioned way, if you will. Uh, we're not here to displace that. We're here to create the, the, to respond to the gap in reduction in supply and increase in demand. Um, again, local economies uh, re rely on fishing around the world, particularly in developing countries. Uh, we're not here to displace that at all, but we're really here to, to flatten out some of the, the supply challenges we have and also provide consumers with you know, great tasting products that they currently are avoiding. We'll talk more. On, the, on the other side, we've got one, and then, and then you're next. Hi. Uh, do you already have edible prototypes for either the salmon or the uh, scallop? scallop? And if not, how close are you? Great question. So, so this entire industry is, is relatively new. So again, there have been some prototypes around ground meat and even some fish cakes uh, that some others have done. Our whole focus, very candidly, is on scale. So, so we too can go out there with a splashy, you know, single scallop prototype um, and, and get some buzz. But our whole focus and our whole team from day one, and the reason we're able to attract funding, was a, an absolute commercialization strategy. So to answer your question, we see ourselves having a prototype that represents scale in, in roughly two years and actually being in the, on a regional market within four years. So, so it's reasonably close. Um, the scale production is really key. And again, the Neptune Award will be allocated towards that specific you know, model of what that first plant might look like. Kathy. Looking at your model, you said that uh, this comes from fish cells, um, and then you, you propagate from there. Um, and so in my mind, this had huge implications for, um, you know, for, we're talking seafood, so, I, so you know, my mind first went to Jakob's Epstein uh, disease, the mad cow disease. But in fish, we have ciguatera and other other uh, diseases that we can get from fish. So how do you how do you filter that out? How do you um, make sure that the product that you're going to give us is free of that kind of issue? Great question. So so again, we're beginning with some other cells, if you will, <clears throat> that we'll ultimately be able to test through uh, through various types of analyses that they're free of any environmental contaminants, parasites, pathogens, etc. One question that hasn't been addressed, but I'll actually throw it out there, is, is regulatory policy. 
um, which relates to this question. So, so I recently uh, made a public testimony to the FDA, and we're going to the USDA in two weeks. So the FDA has been extraordinarily proactive in helping. They see this happening, USDA as well, uh, and they're looking at interagency uh, support of this, of this whole uh, process. Um, it's, it's akin to other industries that the FDA currently regulates. They're obviously regulating uh, biotechnology products, but in the food industry we have enzymes uh, and even fermentation and beer and, and wines and so forth. There's a lot of akin industries. Um, and there's a process called HACCP, which is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. It's an acronym, um, HACCP. So again, it's, all, it's about just what you're suggesting, that we would analyze what are the potential hazards that could occur. Uh, they're typically broken down into physical, chemical, biological. Um, and it's the same hazards that exist in the conventional meat and poultry industry. So this HACCP process actually is adopted in both uh, FDA and USDA inspected products. And, and we will certainly identify those critical control points. Should that occur, how do we eliminate it from ever occurring? So we're identifying any possible hazards and then making sure that they don't exist. Um, and, and very candidly, it's a far safer process than exists today, where these products can, can happen you know, quite randomly in products, and we will absolutely have control because we're controlling the manufacturing, and it's quite a sterile environment as well. It is. All right, great. Tom, thank you. Thank you. Smooth. Good job.